my presentation is complement of uh, Dr. B's presentation, but it's based on our experience. So this is the title of my presentation. I won't deal on that anymore. Um, these are the factors that we consider that are important in terms of what we call eating quality. Color, which is more related to the purchasing decision, but then also tenderness, juiciness, and flavor. And we see here which are the factors that influence these parameters. In terms of tenderness and juiciness, which are very, very important, we, th we see that intramuscular fat plays a role. But there are several opinions on this. Some find a positive effect, others find no effect, and even some find a negative effect. So after all, we are a little bit confused. There are some suggestions as what should be the threshold for the intramuscular fat content of meat in terms of eating quality. And they range from one to four. Okay, there are many, many opinions on this. And to keep in mind that in some modern genotypes, intramuscular fat is only 1% or less. So we can expect that this meat is going to be not very pleasant to eat. And not only in terms of intramuscular fat, but in terms of water holding capacity and juiciness, which and, and, and cooking losses. So all the juice is gone after cooking, so when we put it in the mouth, it doesn't release anything. So the, the sensation is not very pleasant. So I think there is a lot of, of work to do to improve the quality of pork. Just a reminder of how the pig is born. Dr. Wick has presented this. The pig is born with very little fat, but a uh, 100 kilogram pig has between 20 and 35 percent fat, of which much of it is in subcutaneous and very little in the intramuscular fat. So after all, mm, these opinions on, on the role of intramuscular fat, we set up an experiment to test how local consumers would uh, appreciate pork. And we divided the meat in four groups containing different levels of intramuscular fat. And what we found in terms of visual perceptions is that there were two groups of, of uh, consumers. One which we call Marvel loin lovers, which prefer mostly the meat with the highest intramuscular fat, not, not the surprise here. And then the lean loin lovers, which prefer the leanest meat. No surprise here. In terms of for preference, the tendencies were of obviously reversed. But what is interesting here is what was the overall eating acceptability. This is composed of many factors, but this is an overall picture. And there are three things that I find interesting here. First. When you are below three, or you are between one and two, it doesn't matter how much intramuscular fat you have, because the perception is the same. Second is that the more intramuscular fat, the better. So it seems that there is no limit for the moment. Between this group and this group, there is increased uh, <coughs> perception of, of, t of uh, pleasant experience. And the, th the third thing, and th this is uh, more interesting to me, is that between the marble lovers, which were the ones that were purchasing the lean, the lean meat, I mean, the, the, the marble lovers were the ones which liked fat. And the lean lovers, there was no difference. In fact, even here, the lean lovers even like uh, this one a little better than the other one. So this is a a very good representation of how complex purchasing decisions are. Because these lean lovers purchase this meat, but then they prefer this one. Okay. <coughs> so now the next question was, what can we do through nutrition to improve meat quality in terms of eating quality, particularly intramuscular fat? Because as we have seen, intramuscular fat is an important uh, <coughs> consideration. So going again over uh, 
Dr. B's presentation, there are factors that affect this, this parameter. Breed, genes, there are about 40 genes involved in, in, uh, in um, intermuscular fat deposition. Heritability is variable. Then life body weight, as we increase body weight, we have more intermuscular fat. Fatness, well, castrated males have more overall fat and particularly more intramuscular fat. And then the temperature. Um, at low temperatures, you have more fat deposition. So there is an optimum between 16 and 21 degrees for growing pigs. Okay. In terms of nutrients that we can add to the diet to influence intramuscular fat, there is a very interesting one. Conjugated linoleic acid, Dr. Bees mentioned this one. And this is particularly interesting because it has been reported to decrease overall fatness, but to increase intramuscular fat. So it's a perfect situation. You have less fat overall, but you have more very wide. But unfortunately, the responses seem to be very variable because they go from minus 60 to plus 55. Even in the Iberian pigs, which are reported to have a lot of intramuscular fat, we see an effect. Okay. But there are reports on all situations. Some that find an increase, some that find no effect, and some that even find a reduction. So after this, you say, well, what is the situation with the pigs with that we normally use? And we conducted an IRTA study with 16 girls uh, from uh, Brock and Landras Cross between 73 and, and 172. And it was a typical diet in which we had 4% of conjugated linoleic acid, which compared to other studies is a lot, okay? Because normally people use one or 2%. And here we, we used more because we, s we thought if we have more, the effect should be more evident. And what happened? Well, here we see that in terms of uh, fat in this particular depot, we had significantly less fat. And overall, in all depots, we had less fat than in the control peaks. Okay. So in the end, these peaks were slightly leaner than the other ones, the, the control ones. So the effect of conjugated linoleic acid was as expected, although I wouldn't say very dramatic. But when we come to intramuscular fat, here is the disappointment. No effect in the, in the longissimus dorsi or in the semimembranosus <coughs> muscle. So when it comes to all the studies that have been conducted our would fall in this category, okay? So next, another thing that we can try, vitamin A. Vitamin A in, in, um, in ruminants, and particularly in beef, is known that when you remove vitamin A from the diet, you get more intramuscular fat. And this is a very interesting effect. And in pigs, there have been some reports that the same thing happens. But the results here are very variable because some groups find an increase, but others have tried to put more vitamin A in the diet, and what they find is that the more vitamin A you have, the more fat you have. So the effect is really confusing. So we, we thought, let's see what happens to our pigs. So we conducted a study with 48 barrels, and we had three diets. One was not supplemented at all with vitamin A. So all the vitamin A, actually not vitamin A, but beta carotene from the diet was <coughs> very little, okay? So no vitamin A in the, in the premise, okay, okay? Then we had another level which was 1,250 units, which is close to what the NRC requirement states, and then this is a, a typical level in a premix, okay? So what happens here? Let's concentrate on the only on, the on, on fat. In terms of perirenal fat, the more vitamin A, more perirenal fat. 
and in terms of intramuscular fat, although the effect was not significant, the more vitamin A we had, more intramuscular fat. So, contrary to our initial hypothesis that removing vitamin A, we would find more intramuscular fat, the response was just the opposite. So, another disappointment. Okay. Now, again, going to Dr. B's presentation. The effects of diet protein, dietary protein, and lysine. And then other amino acids that have been tested. Okay. The thing is that most of the studies where the lysine effect is tested also decrease protein. So you never know whether the effect is due to protein or to lysine. Okay. So there is only one study in which dietary protein, dietary protein has been reduced without affecting lysine. Okay. Then, thank you. Then others in which they have tested lysine, and many in which they test both, both effects, then leucine and arginine. It's interesting here that in some studies, the effect is dramatic, I would say, because we go from 2.7 intramuscular fat to 9.4, which is impressive. This is even more than what you can get with, uh, through genetic uh, modification. Okay. Others, even uh, pretty important. 1.3 to 2.7. So we are in the range where the, the increase would be very good because uh, we will go over this 2% uh, line. Okay. In terms of leucine, we, there are two studies which show that increasing leucine increases intramuscular fat. And arginine, there is also one study showing that if you add lysine, uh, arginine to the diet, then you will increase. Okay. But others find no effect. So Again, what happens to our pigs? And we had this experiment in which we had two levels of protein and two levels, two levels of lysine in a, in a factorial arrangement. Here, I would say that the, the levels of protein are very low, okay? So even the starting level is, is, is low. What happens? In terms of average daily gain, good performance. These, piglet, these pigs were growing at about 900 grams per day, which is, which is good. Okay. In terms of fit to gain, except for the treatment which had low lysine and high protein, there was no negative e effect. So you could reduce lysine in a, low, in a low protein diet and nothing wrong happened. In terms of intramuscular fat, that's the interesting part. You find an increase in intramuscular fat you, when you have <coughs> this diet, high protein, low lysine, but this was not very good in terms of performance. But then in this diet, low protein and high lysine, we have an increase in intramuscular fat. But the effect is not very dramatic because 16% in, in terms of intramuscular fat is very good. In the semi-membrane also, the, the picture was slightly different because here the, the effect was more dramatic. But in, the, in this diet, with the high lysine and low protein, the effect was not so clear. Okay. So this was somehow good news. You can reduce protein, maintain lysine, and you get an, uh, an increase in intramuscular. Then we said, now let's see what happens to leucine and arginine. And again, the effect of protein. Okay. We had different diets here, one with arginine, leucine, combination of the two, low protein, and then low protein with these two, with the hope that this would be the, say, the, the desideratum, because you have all combination of all the factors that would increase intramuscular fat. So let's see wha what happens now. In terms of performance, this diet with all the combination of low protein, low arginine, high, high arginine, and high leucine, poor performance. We had a an antagonism between leucine and the rest of branch chain amino acids, so this ruined our results in also in terms of feed conversion. The other diets were pretty much the same. Now, in terms of intramuscular fat, this is the control, and nothing improves the control. Just in some cases, you find the opposite effect. So, now to summarize, in terms of intramuscular fat, our experience is that the more, the better in terms of feeding quality. Going to the effects of CLA, you can say the effects are 
variable depending on the cell. In terms of vitamin A, the same thing. In terms of protein reduction, you find an effect, but not always. In terms of lysine reduction, you find an effect, but not always. In terms of leucine, some studies say it increases, but not always. And in terms of arginine, we had an effect that was contrary to what had been reported. So now, now the question is, why not always? And this is a clue, but I don't think that this is the final answer in any case. Let's compare the, the first experiment on protein with the second, okay? In the first experiment, we had this Landras by Durok cross, and we find a nice increase in intramuscular fat. In the second experiment, we had a cross in which there was a Pietrang male that uh, <coughs> participated in the, in the operation, and we find that not only there is an increase, but there is no increase, but there is a rather small decrease. So maybe the clue is that this Pietrang is blocking the effect, and maybe this is a clue to the answer to, to the problem, okay? So the answer is, can we increase intramuscular fat through nutrition? We say yes, but sometimes only. Okay, thank you very much.